Let's speak in the breath. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Your Heavenly Father, we come today to speak to St. Joseph. We come today to look at your scriptures, study your word, and we come to know you better. Help us to understand the faith you've given us. Come through this study, this time of conversation. Love more deeply day by day. We entrust this time to the hands of our mother as we say, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah. You mentioned the Feast of St. Joseph. So yes. Today is St. Joseph the Worker, yes. and March 19th is St. Joseph. Yes. Also. So why is it they have two? Um, so Pius the 12th pound of this day as a response to the communists. Oh. The day is May Day. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is the great communist holiday. Oh. And so St. Joseph, uh, so Pius X wanted to respond to that and to say, no, we're going to focus on Joseph today. Oh, okay. This so is Joseph's the, work. The 10th or the highest the 10th? Highest the 12th. 12th, that's my class. Yeah, yeah, choice. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so that's this, interesting. So, so, so this is Joseph okay. as a defense and as a Catholic okay. answer. Okay. 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 Oh, great. Oh, that's Thank cute. you. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so this is a reminder of the importance of work and the importance of how we can bring our whole life to God on our own. Okay. So we're going to look at, hopefully, hopefully, uh, three <laughs> yeah, different <laughs> events. Uh, finish up. <laughs> so we'll look at the Bronze Serpent, which I'm hearing is someone's favorite topic. Uh, loving, really love snakes. Uh, we'll look at the prophecy of Balaam. And we'll look at the end of Moses' death, his final words. Um, at least as much as we can before we have this up here. But we'll see if we'll get together. Um, let's start by reading Numbers chapter 21, verse 45. Five verses, let's look at the story. Would somebody like to read or should I? All right. <laughs> From Mount Hor, Zal the Red Sea Road to bypass the land of Eden. When their pagans went out for the journey, they were complained against God and Moses. Have heard this before. <laughs> Why did God brought us up to Egypt to die in this desert, where there is no food or water? We are disgusted with this wretched food. In punishment, Lost among them people Sarah's servants. They bid the people as many of them die. Mm -hmm. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned and repented against the Lord of you. Pray and warn the servants from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make the servant Sarah from my home from the pool. And when books, and when the bid looks at it, it will recover. So Moses accordingly made a bronze servant. But I read him one of the bit by a servant that the bronze servant he would come. So we have here quite a more of the same. Right? The people are upset. They grumble. A couple of sins here that's going on. First of all, is they grumble against God. So they're, they're discussing God's problems. And they say we long for Egypt. And they discuss with the food. So what they're saying here, the rumble has their their several parts. First of all, they're just they're rejecting God. Um, they're rejecting God. Secondly, they're longing for back for slavery. Back for the sin. They're, they're saying, we're so tired of what you're doing, tired of, of what the Lord leading us. We prefer to be slaves. So it's a rejection. 
They're completely against the food. What food are they completely against? Yeah. The manna. Yeah. yeah. So they're rejecting a miracle, rejecting God's providence, and saying we would be better for us to enslave it. So this isn't just, you know, people just kind of you know, saying, man, I'm tired. No. This is hard to hard time. This is people reject. This is a very serious rejection of God, his providence, his care. Question? Oh, no, no. I was just thinking, so I didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't think. I was thinking, they ought to be lucky that they had anything. <laughs> <laughs> and especially the man. Especially a miracle. Yeah. Um, and, and remember, the man is described as changing the, the, the taste. Right. Rather, it's changing the. It's not. It's not bad food. So that's not just simple food. Uh, it's something that is the dictator here there. So, in punishment, the serpents come, <clears throat> and the serpents are called in Hebrew seraph serpents. This is the same word used for the angels, the seraphim. Um, and it means the fiery or burning. But the angels are first, they're, they're burning love. The serpents, at first, talk about two things. One, I refer to their bite, the poison. Um, there are certain rattlesnakes um, that are described as. The bite feels like, like being grabbed into the white rock pictures. I'm not sure anyone knew how to kind of compare the two of them, that's what the scripture is. Uh, but so it's got the fiery the burn. What's it? Or the other thing that they read, they refer to the color. If you look at ancient color, um, most depending on the you don't see a good color here, it, it's almost a red brown. Um, you know, a, a, a an older pack. You know, it's both bright and red brown, and so it is kind of fire color. As well. And some people say it might refer to the color of the serpents as well, not simply the poison, but kind of this brassy color. And, and the theory would be this is why Moses makes a serpent of bronze. Uh, it would look like similar to serpents, similar to the same color, the same. Uh, it's one of those things where it's not full information. And after they get bit, and after they, they feel literally in their bones the effects of their sin, they turn to God and they say, Lord, forgive us. We sit against you. Moses, pray for us. Another very interesting happens here. Moses is told to make a bronze sermon. Most of the healing, most of the miracles, we'll go back to this at the uh, ten plagues. Moses prays. The, the people don't repent for a short time. Yeah. Moses prays, this goes away. Most of the time, you know, it's, it's, it's very simple. But this miracle, the Lord asks for something. The Lord has asked for, for an additional act of trust, an additional act of repentance, mm -hmm. an additional turning back to Him. So He asks that there be, first of all, somebody makes the service. People have to, it's not like God always do this himself. We also have a commission to make it, carve it, to, to mount it. And as we told these things, everyone has to then do it. So there, there is a deliberate act of repentance with a ceremony. We almost have here the writings of confession. That was one has to publicly acknowledge the sinner got bit by sin, now we gotta go take care of my sin. And there is this guarantee. If you look at this image of your sin, what do you say? What kind of snake is Sarah serpent? Well, not really not. There are theories. So one of the I don't know. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna leave the room and call you play that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, just make sure you bring your drink, the bronze serpent with you. You're a Moses. 
And one of these is the Denner Corn Viper, which is kind of the right color. This is the right green. Uh, it does, um, interesting enough, it does have this little blue forehead toss head. It's for saving the uh, image for, for the death of four. For saving. Um, but, you know, it's not, we're never described as having four, it's never described. So there's some, this isn't a very popular thing. Other thing that's interesting here is you look at Isaiah chapter 30. Talks about the same fiery serpent in different context, and it describes them as flying. So it says these snakes are flying Sarah mm -hmm. is, is, is this poetry, or is this, is this, is this something else? Um, so, other possibility is the carpet viper. It's a kind of rattlesnake. And I was looking at an article today that the ten reasons why they're convinced this is the Sarah Serpent. It is the right color, it's the right region. There's a Roman source plan that I didn't talk about on the screen enough to buy it. It's about maybe six years up, so maybe that's fine to talk about as the rearing up. And also, interestingly enough, five years of this one, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> the poison of this uh, caused bleeding. Oh. Uh, and so when once you get bit, you'll bleed. Yes. Yeah. Bleed out. It's in the blood. You have the blood, and then your gums bleed, your face bleeds. Yeah. It's very pleasant. But this would be not the image of Christ's cross. But Christ points to the cross. So this would be would this be an image of Christ's crucifixion for his blood to pour out. Awesome. And the third possibility is the Egyptian cobra. One thing about this is that it, so it's getting the right color, they are, they are very brassy color, the cobras of Egypt. Um, they're tied to Egypt, so again, it's, it's, is this perhaps you know, the Lord, the, the bond for Egypt, goes mind that it's in Egypt, the sin deploys the bond for Egypt. Um, you have um, the description of that sort of flying. So think about the cobra, the reason why they can be described as flying. Is cobras? Some years. Actually, some cobra pipe trees, and will jump out of the tree. Oh, how wonderful! And so, not flying in the sense of, but they're coming to mind from the air. Um, and so, with this, perhaps. That, that thing. And one question with this is the region of the desert they were in, they're not, not found there very long. Now it's a miracle, so does this mean anything? But so the, there aren't any trees in the area, so perhaps this took up the flying part. Um, but it's a snake. It's poisonous. If you're curious, look at those up. Um, each of those have <laughs> There's a fourth possibility. It could be a special snake that God made. Absolutely. It could be a special snake. It could be a miraculous thing. It could be a spiritual thing. Uh, there's, there's one theory which I quote this word entirely that says it, it's a a parasite, but this small. Oh, but no. I don't think so, yeah, but, I think so. Um, but it, it does have the name Draculonisis, parasite. Oh, <laughs> Draculonisis. Um, <laughs> My leaning is toward the cobra, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Not not the biggest most important detail, but just interesting if I get a picture of what's going on. I have. More importantly, though, is what it is spiritual. And our Lord tells us in John chapter three that this bronze serpent is a type, is a prophecy of the cross. Look at John chapter 3. This is the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Christ on the boat night. And Christ talks about baptism. We miss this conversation about baptism. Our Lord says this to Nicodemus. This is John chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man also be lifted up. So that when he believes in him may have eternal life. So this serpent is a this serpent it is a image, a type, a foreshadow, a prophecy of Christ's crucifixion of the Christ's Lord and Break. A black commentator says, look at Psalm 21 or Psalm 22, depending on which, which I think probably most books you have here, Psalm 22. Um, I'm trying to have Psalm 21, verse 6. This is the famous song that begins, My God and I like you forsaken. Psalm 20, verse 6 of the psalm says, I am a worm and no man. And in many languages and cultures, worm is, 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 is sometimes used to describe snakes. It doesn't look very similar. And, uh, sometimes you know, it's called the called serpent worm. Uh, is kind of a, uh, an insulting term for a snake. And so, well, if, if you're saying it's not important, it's, look at that word on the back. It's really a serpent. It's the word. Um, and so the commentator, so it's the thought, it's the thought, says that this is referring to himself you know, being that wrong serpent. Um, so even though it's the word work, it's perhaps a reference to the wrong serpent. What do the rabbis say about this passage? Rashi, who died near 1103 AD, and he quotes the Mishnah, the Talmud. This would have been the commentary on the kind of Christ. He says, could the copper serpent Cause life and death. Obviously, not. I can't cause life and death by itself. It, it, it's a image. The explanation is that the Israelites gave the serpent milk of a pot, projected their hearts, their father in heaven, they were keep. They did not do this, they were wasted away. In other words, what Rashi is saying is the important part here to look at is everything that looked up from heaven. Their sin has caused them to look up toward heaven and to humble themselves before God, their heavenly Father. And so this whole point of this experience is to remind them, you rely upon God for everything. Because for everything, we or we be the hell without God. Grand Ma, died in 1270. Says God works to cure it. The actual cure itself healing the miraculous means of looking at the false serpent, the way he hears. And he says that according to the darkness of time, he gives several examples that would sound very strange to us, but he gives several examples of this, where he says that when somebody is affected as some poison, you avoid the source of poison. You think about it. You'll be bit by a mad dog, don't think about dogs. Don't think about dogs, think about dogs, that, that, that would cause you to die. And this be part of that. But he says, God does his power to be doing the opposite. Because God takes what is the, the wicked, the, the, uh, the sickness, the evil, the disease, the illness, he's the cure. It appears to me, Rabbi Trapak says, Moshe ben Maha. But the secret of this matter is that this is one of the ways of the Torah. Every which is a miracle within a miracle. Thus, the Torah, whose injury by means of the cause of the injury, the illness is the means of the cause of the sickness. As the rabbi mentioned in this verse, the eternal showed him the tree. It's referring to Elijah casting in the wood into, or in Moses, Moses casting in the wood into the bitter waters. And with the salt, this cast the water making the fresh. So the rabbis recognize here, it's been understood by, 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 by Moses and by Nicodemus. 
And there's two things happening. One is an objective God, and two, it is a cure for their rebellion. The church follows, of course, after this fact, this leaders. The serpent of Adam was the death of Christ. How the serpent came dead, the devil came his way back to sin. So Augustine then ties us back to, of course, Genesis. Where the serpent comes and tells man to sin, and he says, This, this is the defeat of the devil in you. The Lord took upon his flesh and poison of the serpent, which is sin, but the devil. Might be the likeness of the flesh, the penalty of sin, that is fault. Penalty of the fault, the other way. In other words, the same way a broad serpent looks like a serpent, we have the poison of the serpent. So Christ takes upon our nature, our flesh, of having our sin, the poison in our flesh. So that when Christ comes as a man, it comes without fault, without sin, without weakness. But still looks like us. In our sinful humanity, bearing our weaknesses, our burdens, our own death. This way, John Chrysostom said this. He does not say the Son of Man must be suspended, but the up. So, what are the term in the figure? He used the figure of the bronze serpent to show that the old sensation of the old law is like the new. And to show that for his hearers, a county suffered all terror, his death issued love. It's the obedience that saves Israelites. By their faith, their trust, their obedience to God. So when Christ comes, he comes with Jesus. When Christ comes, he comes obeying his Father. And so those who follow Christ, in their Christ, look upon the cross, do so in obedience and faith. So you have here then the bronze serpent here up. Uh, Theophylact says this. The bronze serpent was the appearance of the adopted creature, God is poison. So when Christ likes us in the flesh, of course. So how is the bronze serpent type of Christ? How is this revealed to us the crucifixion of Asian Christ wins for but first of all, in both cases, death is called by sin. The bronze serpent is the rebellion, the long for Egypt, the saying we prefer to be slaves and to follow God. We reject God's miracles, the man, we reject what God's done for us. And so they die. Death is caused by sin. And of course, I forget we have both mortal sin or spiritual death, and this is what that itself is caused by sin. Death conquers death. The likeness of the bronze serpent, this image of death, is what defeats death. So the bronze serpent, you have this symbol of death destroying them. You have this, this picture of death as a way of it. The Lord doesn't say, put a picture of an angel, put a picture of life, put a picture of, put a, picture of a tree that gives life good health. He could have said, look upon life, look upon my throne, look upon the Ark of the Covenant. Just look upon death. Look upon death, what he said. Because when Christ comes, he comes to die. And by his death, he comes to death. By his death, he overthrows the poison of sin, or throws it up to us by our choices. By death, he conquers death. Looking at the bronze servant by itself, it was no good. They had to repent first, apologize to God first, look for God first, humble themselves, and say, We're going to follow him. Without that, looking at the serpent's not going to make good. It's, it's not, it's not a, a the serpent doesn't have the power. Right? That's the point of the reverence. It's not that there's this great amount of sin that you can't serve and be saved from snake bite. It's humility, trust, repentance. They had a first to recognize their sin, 
So I could turn back to God, third, and trust in the mercy. And when coming to Christ on the cross, simply saying, Boy, if Christ saved me, I'm going to follow Jesus, but it's no good. A repentance, belief, and trust. We have to be sorry for our sins, reject them in our lives, I want to train. We have to trust who God is, trust who Jesus is, who he says he is. Turn towards him repentance, believe in his word, and follow The broad serpent gives us lesson that we have to follow Christ in our real lives. Only then does his crucifixion, his cross, save us. You wear a cross in your ears as jewelry, and I think must be in my school unless you believe what that means. You know, a pagan, you know, an atheist wear a, a cross you know, ring or a cross earring. Not doing any good. Lots of people pass by with the crucifix. But unless you believe and trust the back of repentance, it's not going to be any good. We have here an image of the innocence of Christ. And Christ was like as you've said, not to the same. The serpent. His likeness of death, but not death itself. And so Christ here is being prophesied, being promised to us, the Messiah is going to be sinless. Right? So when we have it, we can look back at all the, all the images, the prophecies, and the promises of the Messiah. Here we have a promise that the Messiah is going to come, is going to be sinless. Mm-hmm. Is going to do away with sin, is going to solve the path of sin and sin. He's both a son of Adam. <coughs> yes, sinners. For the innocent, free from evil. And this, of course, only must be fulfilled by the divinity of Christ. Only so because Christ is divine, this is possible. So we have here again this, this very simple image, this very simple picture description, an incredible, beautiful display and prophecy of our Lord. You also have Christ is going to die in obedience. In the same way that the bronze serpent helps because of the obedience of Israel. Christ saves us by his obedience. In other words, not by necessity, not by uh, being forced to, not but freely in obedience and love for the law. And so we're saved because of the turn to love and obedience to the law. Very, very simple image. But profound. Very, very deep. You can yeah, try a whole book, that are books. So this is the little interesting. There's five verses in the scripture, which reveals so much about the Lord is. Our Lord, again, it's something that, again, our Lord says, this is my cross. But he's saying that he deep and he's saying, you already have the answer. But he was competent enough to not understand that, how can he be saved back? How is that that we can be referred to our sins? Christ is saying that Nicodemus, you've studied the scriptures. It's there, written, written, written there for you. This is referring to me. And so, and so this image is, this is a prophecy given to us by God, which helps us understand what he's doing and how he's saying it. Questions? Comments? Please. In class seven, you talked about prophecy, yes. and at that time, I was uh, thinking about the uh, the bronze serpent and the and the uh, prefiguration or foreshadowing of right. uh, Jesus. And so, then you also mentioned type, mm-hmm. and this is meant, so. I was wondering at the time if if types, foreshadowing, prefiguration, all that that be considered like under prophecy. Yes. Under pro- okay. Yeah. Um, so. That's a little side note, but for one. So prophecy. Um, prophecy is a big category, and there are a couple different kinds of prophecy. All prophecy is going to speak to man about God. And more than that, it's communication from God to man.
was not just some random guy making things up on this guest, some nice thoughts. The good insight is God revealing something of himself in who he is. In a very broad sense, any kind of, of speaking to the man, even those that don't refer to the record of Christ, are prophecy. So anytime God comes and appears to anybody and says, follow me, do my will, obey me, listen to me, this is a prophecy, in a very broad sense. In a deeper, more, more important sense, it refers to, so I need this more clearly, it refers to a revelation and preparation for Jesus. <coughs> but in the end, anything Old Testament is. So, I mean, yeah. it's all this, but there are some that are more direct, more direct promises. And there are two main kinds of this, but even this you probably buy. But there's types, which are also called prototypes, also called foreshadowings. I can spell, I can't. That's good. <laughs> well, it's not it. These are all the same thing. And so these are, you could say, a prophecy in action. This is some action, some event, some person which we chew on and you understand deeply about the person of Christ. So this is a thing, a person, an event, which shows him a Christ life, Christ person, who Christ is. So the Red Sea is a type of that. Or shadow that prototype about. The bronze serpent was a prototype of the cross. Most of the David and Moses and Solomon are types of cross. The manna. The manna type of you. Yeah, absolutely. So it points to the work, the life, the person of cross. And of course, we have the direct prophecy, which is the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is sinless. Um, can't talk about different things right here, of course. Direct prop, direct um, telling of us. Direct promises. So you could say, is it a promise? And there are far fewer of these promises. There's a lot of ways. There are fewer promises than there are in times. I mean, so Genesis, for example, Genesis chapter 3, 15. Of an elf and between you and the woman her seed years, who will crush your head when you strike his heel. That's the direct promise of the Messiah. Between he says to King David, I'll put the son upon your throne who will rule forever. That's the direct promise of the Messiah. But every page is full of these types of foreshadowings. But all of them are promises. All of them are preparation, revelation of Jesus Christ. His work, his person. So his work. This person, a work meeting again, I think about involved in salvation, his mission is coming back to the cross, from the man, uh, who he is, what he does for us. Um, so all of these are revealed to us by a bit. The Messiah is coming, it isn't just some nice man, but it is God himself. Being prepared to recognize that God is Trinity, that God became man, that God saved us by that dying on the cross, and then we united him through his, these human beings called sacraments and my prayer. So all of these are preparing us for this. And the bronze serpent is the type of the cross. As I can. Thank you. I noticed that's new. Fancy, fancy. I was wondering when you were going to stop erasing me. <laughs> you were getting used to the fact that you had your other board. That's funny. Is that the more than the question there? That's it. Then I had another, I don't know where I got this from. So, like, being led to the promised land and all, uh -huh. it kind of depicts us trying to be led to, to heaven. Right. Yes. Yeah. So the whole the whole journey of Moses and, and forty years in the desert, and honestly, the stupidity of Israelites is a art spiritual journey. 
You know, where we need to be able to say, I come back to God even though I fall off. Even when I'm an idiot and I sin and knowing the truth, I come back to God and he'll accept and know he's going to say The Lord wants to kill off those parts of my life, those parts of my person, which cling to sin, cling to legion. Which, which even though I have the Eucharist and the manna and, and the true Moses and all the stuff they have with me, the part is a long story of Egypt and a slave to sin and all the other things. And God's a patientist and very forgiving and very merciful. And it's wonderful that he is. Thank God. <laughs> 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 Again, that first reading of prophecy. Um, yes, absolutely. It's not just for a select few, but everyone that's a full of Christ has these gifts from God. Let's move on to Bob. <laughs> Bottom of this interesting story, something that's fascinating, is Numbers 22 to 24. And again, we're only going to do highlights from this, uh, but we certainly could break it down a whole lot. More, more than I'm going to be doing. The story of Bottom is this is a, at the very end of the 40 years. Uh, so the those who have denied um, uh, the promised land have all passed away. Right ahead of the promised land. The Moabites are seeing the victories, seeing the miracles that God's working in the midst of Israel. And they're fighting. And they say, I don't know what to do about this. We need to, we need to find some way to get, to get rid of them. Some way to be, some way to, to, to protect ourselves. And so King Balak who is the king of Moab, has a bright idea. He says, I know of this prophet named Baal. And I'm going to hire him to curse Israel, to send his curse on Israel from God, Therefore, they'll be destroyed, they'll be protected. You've got to fight fire with fire. You, have, you can't fight them with an army, you can't fight them with earthly power, you can't fight them with any human means. We have to go fight them with spiritual power. So I'm going to go fight, find this guy named the Baal. Baal is an interesting figure of this. He is described as not from Israel. He's a pagan. He's not a pagan. He's a true prophet who God speaks to. He's called the servant of the Most High. He seems to only believe in one God. He truly speaks to God. God speaks to him very clearly. But he also is both at the same time seen as a very holy man because God speaks to him 
and it reveals things through him. And also at a very honorable time at the same time. He's a very interesting figure. And Balak comes to Moab with about the seven men of Balak and says, I want you to curse Israel. And Balak first refuses, I can't do that. I can only speak whatever God wants me to speak. I can only want to curse Israel. And King Balak sends more and more men. He sends greater officials, more presents. He says, Please curse Israel. And Balak refuses. And then God appears to him and says, if he comes back and him again, Go with him, but speak the words I give him. And Bob goes, okay. The Lord, said, the Lord comes and says, said, go do that, and to go to you and to defeat your request. Only speak and warn you right now. Only we'll speak whatever God tells him to speak. And Bob goes, okay, phew, we got this guy, we're good. Every only this book. Right. Curse is And on the way to go to King Bala, there's the story of Bala's eyes, which I'm sure some of you have heard before. <laughs> and you can link up the use of the term. You're with a bunch of three-year-olds. <laughs> um, and the story is that on the way there, God is angry with Bob because he wants, he's only going there for a personal gain. He's going there more for the presence and the fame and the friendship he's going to get with the king. He's not really going there to his witness to God, even though, even though he was doing it because I said so. It's hard of hard to doing it because he wants presents and money and fame and pop. And so an angel of the Lord appears where it stands in front of the road to kill Paul. And the donkey in which he rides stops. Now we're four. And so Bottle begins to beat him. And then the donkey speaks. <laughs> the donkey says, Why are you beating him? And Bottle just answers him. Maybe he's not rather realize this is, this is weird. He says, Because you won't listen to me. You have to be really mad at this point. That's it. Like a way of really straight about here. He says, because you're listening to me, or you're, you're, you're disobeying me. He says, I'm saying it. The, the donkey answers, and he says, in front of me, will kill you unless you turn aside. I'm saving your life. Um, what we have here is we, we have the God can work anything. God's power uh, is able to work many things. So, so when Balaam repents, and he goes to Balak in repentance, um, and then King Balak says, okay, now curse Israel. And Balaam instead blesses Israel. And Balaam blesses Israel. And Israel is blessed and holy and wonderful. Balak says, no, to the, to the curse Israel. It's not, it's not like he says, what are you doing? And Balaam says, only speak what God wants to speak. And Balaam says, okay, fine, do it again. Of course, Israel. And he left Israel as happy. And Balaam says, what are you doing? I told you to curse Israel. He's like, only do it what God tells him to speak. Well, curse Israel. Third time he left Israel. And then when Balaam gets upset again, he prophesies about the Messiah. And this is the famous uh, prophecy you've all heard, which refers to the star of David. Um, let me pull this out over here. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. So the singular person. A star shall advance from Jacob and a staff from Israel. It will smite the brows of Moab, which is Balak. It will crush you, Moab. And the skulls of the Shuhites, which is possessed, which is the battle in Israel, shall the greatest overcome his foes.
At this point, Bala gives up and says, okay, whatever, we're going to lose. There's a couple of interesting lessons for us here. And the first is, um, many ones. Um, God <coughs> can work with anyone. So you have here a prophet who's not from Israel, who is not part of the community, but who still seeks out the Messiah, blesses Israel, and works, works for God. Now he has some, his own issues, his own, his own things that he needs to purify himself from. But this you have here is a prophecy as well, even though it's talking about law being crushed nations being destroyed, this is a revelation of all of the human race being called the car of God's family. This you have here is God revealing that there's going to be a call to everyone to worship God and follow God. It's following God not just for a certain nation, a certain race, a certain people. For everyone. Otherwise, Baal would not be a real prophet. Baal would not be a follower of God. And God comes to here and he wants repentance. He wants to, he wants to save him. Balaam, in his greed, seeks power. Even though he speaks to God. And God, in his mercy, warns him. Works a miracle for him and calls him back to himself. So that when he stands for the king, he can reject that power, the glory, and speak the truth. So you have here a couple of lessons for us here, and we have here again our own story. Where it's tempted to to seek God for the wrong reasons. When I use God in the wrong way, we're to only follow Christ if we're going to be praised for. If it's going to give us mercy advantage. If it's going to be my own personal matters. We have here the call of God even for the pagans. And most of us come from pagan stock. We have here the fact that God wants to give his gifts to everybody. That wants to bestow his blessing on the only grace. You see, the prophecy, even though Israel hears about it right now, is given to pagans. King Balak is being given a call here by him. You're the king. You're King Balak. You're a pagan king. You hire this guy, you know that he's a follower, you go punish your enemies, to go curse them, work like magic upon them, basically. And instead, he says, I can only speak the truth, and they may be blessed, and they're going to conquer everything. This is a call. This is a call to, 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 to perhaps an ally, perhaps to follow up from God, perhaps to wait for those things that keep it from them. So this here, we have this prophet of the sign. This is a call to receive the salvation of Christ as well, the pagan nations. And this is actually the sixth promise. There are many types of the sixth promise in the Bible. And it comes to us from Hagar. And it reveals, first of all, the Messiah has come up for a long time. I see him, but not now. I see him, but at least far off. And indeed, the price will come for 1,500 years, give or take. You're one of Israel. And the reason why Balaam blesses Israel rather than curse him is because of the Messiah. From Israel comes the Christ. Israel comes salvation. Israel comes once the save the world. He prophesies and he comes, shed light around the world, the star of God. This is the star that rises, his fat. Support, <coughs> he's strength, and he's, he's light. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 4 and 10. You know, this image of that star of David. Mm -hmm. 
And this is St. John describing the coming of Christ, the birth of Christ, the age of Christ. Those who would lie the Mass, this will be very familiar with the first few. You hear it every Sunday. So this is referring to Christ and then with the Word. Who came to be through Him was light, and this light is the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness not overcome. A man named John of Saint God gave it for testimony to testify to the light. So I believe in Him. He was not the light, but He came to testify to the light. The true light which lights everyone that's coming into the world. This is the star that's coming. That brilliant light is coming. For of course, most, both to the Christmas star and to Christ himself. It shines in the dark places, it shines to die, it shines to the red, it shines to show the way. And he comes, Balaam says, as king. Not just any Israel, he's the king of Israel. Israel here is Israel has no king. There are no kings in the next hundred years. The first, at this time, Israel had, but with Moses, no king. After Moses, the judges, there's no kings for, for a long time. The Bible was already prophesying, promising king for Israel. And the king will crush all the enemies of the kingdom. This is, this is a very beautiful promise we have for our Lord God and Savior, who is King, King of Israel, King of the race, the enemies of salvation, bringing light to the world, and being a staff of support for everybody. And this comes in place of curse. The attempt was to curse, to reject, to condemn Israel. Instead, the enemies have themselves blessed Israel. Even the enemies of God have to bless God. Even the enemies of God have to proclaim God, glorify God, speak to God. Like the serpents. <laughs> Blessing and proclaiming God, spite of ourselves. Where God is even our sin, our bad rejection, and brings back to himself. Because simply, God's with them. This is what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, there's all, there's all kinds of. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. There's all kinds of things talk about here. Any questions on this? There's a lot in here. There's a lot. In here. It's worth going back and reading the lessons, going back and reading the prophecy, going back and reading the stories. But I just want one to point out those things here. Um, maybe today we can actually get through the whole, whole lesson. But questions on this? Let's then turn to the death of Moses. I'm going to write, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Moses is now about 120 years old. Still strong, he locked in. They leave them up the, the foot of the promised land, which can't cross the boundaries. The boundaries of Israel in the promised land, he gives his last speech, his last lesson, his last reminders to the Israelites. And hands of authority to Joshua, telling him to be a man, be strong for God, follow, follow God, follow the will of God. And then he goes off by himself, the mountains where he sees the promised land, sees the gifts of God, dies in the barrier. It's kind of a bittersweet moment. Because we have here, on the one hand, Moses doesn't get ready to go to the promised land. Moses doesn't enter the promised land. Because of his previous sin, his previous anger, his previous belief, he suffers punishment here on earth. That's a great saying. But it is, it is sweet at the same time because he sees not just where, where the people are going to be 
Rebecca right here, he sees the place, but I have no more. He sees as well his glimpse of God's providence and care of salvation. This is a beautiful lack of trust in the part of Moses. And Moses at this moment went to saying, Lord, this is the fair. You know, what a jerk thing to do to me. I, I was happy in any of those moments. The lights of the house will be seen. He exhorts the people, pleases the people, blesses God, and he gives them the great prayers of, of the Jewish people. Deuteronomy chapter 6, part of this long title speech of Moses, this is a key to the Jewish faith, a key to Moses, a key to even today. It's the central verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 6. Or it didn't go as far as 49, I suppose. This is the great Shema. Uh, this, this, is, this is a hymn and a prayer that's still said, still repeated uh, by Jewish people every day. This is something that um, growing up, you would sing this verse as part of my prayer. If you were Catholic, you would sing this verse. So they did dad they were doing and you care all the most. What's the word you use? Shema? Uh, this, is, this is called the Shema. Shema? So, so Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 to 9, you could say, but 4 to 6 is really the thing, but 4 to 9. Um, it's called the Shema. Mm -hmm. Which means hear, listen, or obey. Shema Yisrael, which means here is the Lord is our God. Therefore, love the Lord God with your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Take to heart these words I know you today. Because this is Moses' last gift to this people, his God, or of death. Put them into your children, speak them in public and abroad, your busy or rest. Bind these words that God is to only worship, that God is God. Speak them home and abroad, but your busy or rest. By the words of the sun, depend upon your glory. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and upon your gates. This is something, this exhortation to drill, to speak, to write, to bind, is something to take literally. And so this verse, the Shema, was written down. And a good Jew will, will when they go to pray, has a box called the phylactery. Temple and they will write the by them to their hands and the foreheads. Mm -hmm. And when they pray, it's with these words on their foreheads, upon their arms. And what do they put on? It's a little little box uh, called the Hebrew and the Bella, called in Greek the phylactery. So when Christ says, You widen your phylactery. Length of your taps is referring to this. Is it just for men or men and women? Uh, men. men. Um, they'll also put this in a box called the zuzah. Something like this, what they do. Is that the one on your door? On your door, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. And when they walk in and out, they will kiss the mezuzah. Right. Right, they're honoring these words. In the same way that when I'm in the church, what do we do? We sign the cross. Holy water, reminding ourselves of what God has done for us on baptism, our union with God. So this is this is the union with God, the covenant with God, love with God. And there's a prayer in that, right? There's in that mezuzah. Don't they put a prayer in? So it's this verse and a couple other verses. Yeah. But this they, is the main they, they, they roll it up and put it. Yes. In yeah. 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 So in this little oh, box yeah. is the scroll uh -huh. uh, with this verse and a couple, a couple other verses. Yeah. And then Ten Commandments and some other numbers. Because there's three different verses in there. But this, this is the central one. It's both the mezuzah and these little boxes which are bound their foreheads on their arms. Yeah. Now, would it be wrong for us to have a mezuzah? No. Oh, okay. 
Uh, but we have it, holy water. Uh -huh. So this was taken up now been transformed okay. in the holy water and the sign of the cross. Right, big sign of the cross, what do we do? Everything that the Shema's do. Oh, okay. Sign of the cross, we're saying there's one God we love. We're marking God's sign upon our foreheads, upon our hearts, upon our arms. Gotcha. We are proclaiming Christ's salvation. We're proclaiming the Trinity and the unity of God. We're proclaiming our love for God, the only God's to be adored. We're asking for grace. We're calling upon his salvation. Everything done in here is done by us. Except we're doing that now through Christ, in Christ, not the words Moses, but through God Himself. So there's nothing wrong with Moses. We I was have just wondering if someone gave it to you as a gift, you could display it and it wouldn't. No. No, it's, a, it's the same God, it's the same. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. As long as, long as long, but again, you don't have to what it's saying. What it's saying is so that every time they would do this, what they're doing is that they are renewing the covenant of God. Okay. They're saying, I belong to God, I love God, I follow God, I, I am His. What are you doing with having to the cross? I belong to God, I love God, I am His. This is a renewal of the covenant. This is a, a, a promise to God. This is a, a reminder of what He's done for you, a proclamation of the Trinity and the unity of God. This is a saying, I only want to serve and worship God. So, again, so, so you already are doing it. There's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, so would the mezuzah be like more a co uh, covenant with God the Father and the sign of the cross is, is with no, the Father, no. Son, and Holy Spirit? Um, what I would say is this is the old black and white fuzzy picture. This is, this is clear. Okay. Because even here, the revelation to Moses, um, Moses is eaten by the cross. The covenant only has power because of Christ's death on the cross. Right? The old covenant, which was done through the blood of bulls and goats, only has power and authority and any goodness that points to and speaks about Christ on the cross, as a prophecy of Christ on the cross, and his faith in Christ on the cross. And so the anti Old, Old Testament has power and goodness because of Christ's coming. Prepares for Christ's coming, points to Christ's coming, speaks of Christ's coming. Now, if you try to deny Christ's coming, then there's a problem. Gotcha. But if this is helping to remember Christ, right. But you already have. So the mezuzah could almost be like a prophecy, a thing of prophecy. Absolutely. Um, and I would say it very much is in a foreshadowing of our own ceremonies. The Old Testament is one set of books that got better with time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> way better with time. Yeah, like, we read it and it's way better. Yeah. <laughs> and it um, goes back even with Jesus when he is asked what's the greatest commandment. Right. He yeah. reminds them of this. He's quoting the Quibbles and also Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because right. it's something they said every day. This was something they repeated every day. They saw every day. They kissed every day. Uh, they were saying, I love God. Do this every day. Right? These words of Moses. This becomes part of their renewal of the covenant daily and several times a day. And the heart of the covenant with God is God is one, and I love him. That's the heart of the covenant. And that gets expanded to God is one and three, and he died for us, so we can. Now I love him through his son and his son. And something that again, should be something that, that, you know, we hear the words of Moses and the ditch echo in our ears remind us, you know, that this is what the Israelites were supposed to do with, with the type, with, with the prophecy. How much more devotion do we have the sign of the cross? How, how much more devotion do we have to come to our houses and say, God is with me? Let me do my part in my life. No matter where I am. But my love for God, my remembrance of, of his salvation. We do this when I speak to him, when I lie down, when I go to bed, I wake up. When I begin my prayers, when I'm speaking to my children, I begin with the love of God and salvation. See, here, Mezuzah and the phylactery begins with I love God. 
Here we say, God loved me. And so I can't love him. And so they hear we're loving God in the heart of Christ. But so it includes all this, deal with that. But absolutely, this is certainly a prayer you can say, certainly a thing you can do, certainly a thing that you, you can look at. No place. Can I just make a comment? Please. Um, when I was in Texas with Rachel, they go to an ordinary at church, a chair of St. Peter. Mm. At the beginning of every Mass, the, the priest faces the people and he says a prayer very similar to this. Well, the greatest commandments, like what you just said, you know, to love God, your whole heart, mind, and soul, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. But every single Mass is starts with this. Yeah. Mm. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, we're doing that too. Mm -hmm. That's why we begin every prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Calling upon the so the, the sign of the cross is a creed. It's a prayer for help. It's a reminder of Christ's death and resurrection and nature, and therefore our support. So, so the history of the nutshell. <laughs> it, it is a, a, a pulling our hearts toward Christ. If we follow him, it means we're going to love our neighbor as well. And it's remembering. My salvation in him, I, I begin now as God's child. So I'm praying now as simply as myself, not myself, as, as long as long to God for Christ. Doing everything in the name of the Lord. God is everything. What's that? God, God is everything. God, God is everything. Not in a pandemic sense. <laughs> but the sense of the most important yes. But not in the pandemic sense where the table's gone, the chair's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Human person, your soul, is everything. Um, the insignia the there, is that Hebrew? Or what yeah, is that? sorry. Uh, that's Hebrew for Shema. Yeah. Did you say the Shema when you were young? Yeah, so every night we would chant it as part of our uh, night prayers. Mm -hmm. um, and it is something we wrote, we wrote saying. Mm -hmm. um, if you're curious later and you're thinking, well, but here's the late scene for you. But yeah, um, this, this is very central. This, Reminder of the promised land, from my longing for, for heaven and for eternity. This is Moses pouring out his last will and testament to, to his people. Most of them, by the way, think, think about it. Since, since everyone who is alive here was at, at most 20 years old and younger, it's basically watching them grow up. He seems they were little kids. You know. The oldest one of them was one. The, the youngest group would have been born on the track. Mm -hmm. He's watched the entire time. Yeah. And, and so this is so most of the point I was I mean, this, this is sincerely a very little point, too. But he's saying goodbye to all the people. They're, they're all his children. Mm -hmm. And he's watched all, every single person there. Mm -hmm. He has watched yeah. since they were infants. Moses gives four main parts to the speech. This last one has to be, he says, first of all, he reminds them of everything that God wants them and their promises. He says to them, oh, this, this is many things happened in Deuteronomy. He says, first of all, he says, everybody at the covenant. Don't forget what you promised them. Don't forget about them. Don't forget all, the, all these books, these, these, these rules, this life. It's not the rules, it's a life of God. It's union with God, it's following God, it's being with God. He begs that worship God alone. This is, this is something that um, is a problem continually. Where people have to be reminded where to go along. Whether that's literally or even just like following the word. It's not literal worship of false gods, but it's a real worship of false gods. It's even power. He begs them 
bring up their children and fear the love of God. You know, so, so it passes on to your children with that love God. Help them to know God. Help them to be imbued with God's love. This is your task. And to remember God's blessing as He promises you if you obey and follow. So this is a reminder of blessings and the punishments, a reminder of what they have done for them, telling them their history, telling them all these things is Moses' last speech where he does. <coughs> and he promised at the end of this that God will send a prophet like himself who will see God face to face and speak to them and walk with them and help them. And this is the seventh promise of the Messiah. Because Moses spoke to God face to face, like Adam. Moses shone with God's love. Moses went to the mountain and spoke to God as given the commandments, given the Torah. Christ doesn't just speak to God face to face, he is God. He has always in his heart, in his humanity, he has the deep vision. But he says, he says, not because some people provide more periodically up to see God, talk with God, and back down. He is present with the Father. You see this, for example, in John chapter 17, where he says, Where I am now, I pray that you also may be. He says, I am the, 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 the part of my father, the bosom of my father. The father is always with me, the father always hears me. And so, so Christ is the prophet, not just simply uh, a far deeper, greater than Moses, because he is really. God's will, speaking to God, speaking as God, speaking to God, and you can see in God. Moses himself, let me just stop there. Question on this, comment on this. Moses is a type of Christ. Moses is the very person in his life, speaks unto Christ, reveals to Christ, shows us who Christ is. In a bunch of ways this happens. I think I named you seven ways. Six ways. I give you six ways here, you probably get more than that. But I give six ways here. So first, Moses say this. Moses speaks to God, which is the prophecy, the promise of the prophet. He forms the people of God and the covenant. He's the giver of the law. Which remember it is for the Israelite people the center of who they are. The Torah. He intercedes for sinners. We heard, for example, um, the bronze servant. Because of his prayer and their faith. And he accompanies Israel throughout their journey to the promised land. In all of these ways, Christ is being real to us. Christ is the Savior of Israel. Christ wants to save us by his blood. Christ speaks to God, not just. What he hears, what he knows. Christ speaks not simply of what he's been told, what he sees. Christ speaks and reveals to us who God is because he is God. His very person, very face, the very being, the revelation, the speaking, the telling of God's love and God's person of majesty, who God is. He forms the people of God, the covenant, not simply the blood of sheep and goat, through his own blood, through his own life. Remember Leviticus 9 19. Blood is life. And so when the blood belongs to God because life belongs to God, and so when Christ gives us his blood, he's giving us his divine life. This is why the covenant is formed in the blood of Christ. It's formed in the life of Christ. And because his life is eternal, perfect, and divine, the covenant is formed in the divine covenant, the covenant, and we're formed in the life 
the unity and the divinity of, of, of God Himself. The law He gives is His own person, His own being. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. He is the uh, description and the measure and the exemplar of, of who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to live. He summed us up, of course, to great commandments, uh, but really His own person is our rule of life. Even in heaven, he receives for us. Most importantly, upon the cross, where he dies to forgive us. Even in heaven, he is going to hear our prayer and forgive the Father. And throughout life, he accompanies us on our journey, especially in the Eucharist, which you remember was with the Israelites as long as Moses was there. So was the man. So the Eucharist is here with us throughout our journey in this life. This is Jesus Christ accompanying us to the home So Moses himself. Is this great figure, this, this type, that's another word, another word here, I could put it, figure. Yeah. <laughs> figure, type, the shadow of the cross. Revealing to us the work and the person and who Christ is, what else was. Questions on this? Okay. One last point. Reason, one reason why I wanted to go to these three events. Today we spoke about three things. Finish up the story of Moses. We spoke about the bronze serpent. We spoke about Bob. And we spoke about of Moses' death. These three things reveal to us the three beloveds of Christ. Christ is priest, Christ is prophet, Christ is king. The bronze uh, bottom Ron Summer is the priest of this. We have here Christ's death and sacrifice. Sacrifice of the cross, offering of worship, and praise, and adoration. Christ of the cross is the perfect sacrifice for the priest, offering of adoration, glory, and save sinners. Uh, Balaam speaks about Christ being king. At a time when there was no king vision, except for God. It is God with Israel's king. And so he speaks of the ruler and savior and conqueror. And Moses at his death says that the Messiah will be a problem. So we have here three offices of three ways that Christ is showing us Christ is going to be for us. He is the priest of great sacrifice, salvation. He is the king and saves, becomes our own, who rules in heaven. He is the prophet, who reveals to us. He is, he goes to us God, to see God, come to God, and come to know God. How we know God. Here's how we are helped by God. Here's how we're saved. Now these three events then are very appropriate and very much come together. Because the very rest of this will is them. As we see here, what Christ does in the church, how he leads us, how he guides us, what he does for us. He's priest, he's prophet, he's king. And we're baptized, we also share these three things. And we're doing it now. Right. Um, everyone's awake? Good. We made it through we finished. Finished. We finished. We finished. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Any questions? We'll be distracted. I have a question that's kind of non-related. Okay. Okay. If I have faith that God can do anything, and I pray for either a non-believer or someone who's lost or a non-Catholic, can my faith transcend to them? What can, I mean, how much power does that have when I pray for mm -hmm. people yeah. who are not there, but they need to be, and I hope they will come. I mean, 
So it has great power, will never overcome their free will. Right? So it's not going to overcome their will. Their free will. Oh, their free will. Right. Yeah. But I mean. Absolutely. Am so, I, can I share my, my faith with him that way? Well, what you are is your intercessor, like Moses and Christ. Oh, okay. Um, and so the way I, I was kind of describing it to people is as I said, look, you're putting money in the bank. And right now, it's possible not, they're, they're not going to draw it out. I'm not ready to, 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 to take it out. Mm -hmm. But that, those grapes aren't going to be lost. When they're ready for that, open their hearts to that. If they open up this much, they're going to have that, those, those graces. If they reject them entirely, completely, they're going to get nothing. But still be in the bank. No, that's their free will. The free will, right. Mm -hmm. If they open themselves a little bit, they'll get, they'll get what, what, what they're open to. But those grace will keep piling and piling and piling until the day that they, they open up entirely. What's interesting is these people, this person has said to me, can you pray for me because I know you believe, but so to me that was like, I want to believe. Yeah. And so I keep telling them I pray for you, I like candles mm -hmm. for you, I believe that God can change your life for you. And so, um, I just wondered, I didn't want to off be false. No, no. Uh, so, but this, this reminds me of the prayer of Augusta. It makes me chase, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, Augusta believed when he wasn't quite ready. It took him many years. He was, he'd pray that prayer. He would say, Lord, make me chase something. But, but I'm, not, I'm not ready yet. And it took him many years to, get, to kind of conquer his own sin and sensuality. But that little prayer that he made was a good start. Mm -hmm. Was the best start. It was a good start. It was the best. And he had started there, and then had it gone where it was. Um, and so there's no prayer, if it's a real prayer, that that's grace or works. Well, I didn't think it was, I just wanted it to be. But yeah. I wanted but, it to be, give them true hope. Like, absolutely. And, and so if the book for God, um, when you think they're ready, what I would say is I'm praying for you, but I ask you to ask, I would suggest you also for the Lord, so Lord give you faith. Well, I kind of, in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, maybe by me telling them I'm praying for them, sure. and if they yeah. see positive things, maybe that will give them the faith. It will show them that there's power right. in. It, it, it'll be an opening there, it'll be a reminder there, yeah, that's it. Will, it will be a we call it actual grace. This um, inspiration, this call from God, has turned it. absolutely. Okay, I just didn't want yeah. to be misleading. Misleading. Yeah, yeah exactly. Nope, you're mm -hmm. doing good. And and because it's something that I prefer, and I ask for. I mean, I want them to stay in my life, and so I don't want them. And hopefully you're into eternity with you. Pardon? Hopefully into eternity with you in heaven as well. Yeah. Yeah. Heaven. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, just I yeah. I just wanted to Absolutely. Good. Okay. Good. Yeah. I was watching on the uh, Catholic talk show and mm -hmm. the Catholic talk show they were saying that everybody is born with a garden of angel. Mm -hmm. And I pray for people too. And I know there was a lot of prayers that were done on my, <laughs> my parents. Um, so can we also ask them to intercede? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. That guardian angel? Absolutely, yes. yeah. So the guardian angel. Before. You can ask your guardian angel to care for someone else. Yes, you have some guardian angels and that's a good guardian angel as well. Guardian what are the tasks of the guardian angel? You can also share yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so you can share your guardian angel, you can certainly pray for that as well. One of the tasks of our angels helps to understand and to receive grace well. And so if you're ever having a contentious or difficult discussion with somebody, um, it's helpful to pray that guardian angel will come to hear what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, because that's one, one, of, one of his. Uh, tasks, offices, help us understand. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're having trouble yourself understanding something, ask me to help you. If talk to someone else who is willing to listen, ask their angel to help you listen. Um, mm -hmm. 
it is very helpful. There's no magic book that's always free will, but it is very helpful. Well, to me, I mean, I pray that this person would say, can I talk to Father Clark? <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of where I'm going with this, because I feel like this person is lost. <laughs> this person had a great sin in their life, and I think that where they are is they just feel that they're totally unworthy of ever being forgiven for that sin. And so... It's like, it's like you call me auntie. <laughs> it's like, okay, auntie, pray for me. You know, it's like, and it's like, okay, auntie says that there's still hope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and when you think it's right, absolutely tell them I'm going to talk to them, and you know, Jeff and and say, you know, like, I know this priest is going to have a conversation with you when you're going. Okay. So, different question. Okay. Uh, going back to the meaning of names. Okay. Uh, oh, Israel. <laughs> what does Israel mean, and why is it significant versus his original? Jacob. Okay. You know, that's something I should know, but I forgot it for a second. You got it. Next week. Yeah, next yeah. week. Uh, what does it mean? I know it, but I can't think of what it means. Um, I can tell you simply, I can tell you this at least. Israel refers to God, Jacob does not. Um, the L ending is something to do with God. Whenever you see El or Kirel, like Nathaniel, Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Israel, it's something that refers to God. Uh, and so it's happening, and the, the naming is Jacob is before he has the vision of God, the relationship with God. Israel is after his relationship with God. Uh, when it comes to people, um, Israel is emphasizing the fact that they belong to God. They have the covenant of God. Uh, but the, the sons of Jacob are referring to the promises. The sons of Israel are referring to the covenant. Um, but the actual meaning of the name, I should know, but mine's gone blank on it. I can let you, I, I can put my notes, and I'll let you know next time. So that's like a movie, so you got the analogy of what I can do now. We'll all know the answer next week, right? Yeah, we're making a note too. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you look it up and say, oh, by the way, Paul, makes this. Except we can't read Hebrew. <laughs> Let's Google for search. <laughs> <laughs> Google sometimes has different references than yeah, Father. Yeah, Mike. yeah. <laughs> it's up to date on the language changes. Yeah. <laughs> That's like when Jim was little, the first time he said this to me, uh, it was right when they had the internet. He was just learning to read and everything. And so he thought I knew everything. And one time he asked me a question, I said, "Well, I don't know, honey." And he says, "Well, just look it up on the internet." Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm going to the library, right?" Why do prevail God, or let God prevail? Was that Jacob? Israel. That's Israel oh. because there the refers to the first the rest of the yeah. Yeah. Prevail upon him prevails. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get that. Um, so, so it's one who prevails yeah. with God. And so this is the story, remember, he wrestles, wrestles with the angel, and he overcomes the angel. Um, and so this is, is a um, the wrestling with the angel is itself a description of our spiritual life, where we have to work hard and keep fighting and persevering for the game of lessons in the life that wants to give us. And so, and so this wrestling, this perseverance, this overcoming, has to do with overcoming sin and our, our own weaknesses and our own flesh. And so Israel is the one who overcomes, and therefore is given the name of God. Yeah, that's what Yeah, that gives you a new perspective. Okay, right. any other questions?
he's basically said word for word what the Bible dictionary says. Oh, she doesn't have things. So they don't make it up. Anyways. <laughs> I thought he was going to go back to the media of Jacob. Yeah, there's something from Brady. Oh, Israel is what they were. Yeah. What yeah. she looked up, well, I guess. Right. I was wondering about Jacob. Yeah. I wonder if that's Jacob means, I think my son told me it means wrestles with God. So is that referring to. Doesn't Jacob mean wrestles with God? Uh, Jacob, Jacob means uh, the first the twin. The usurper means usurper. Uh, because, super, right? because he, he tries to take Esau, he takes Esau's place. Uh, he clings to, to Esau's heel oh, as the second right. born of the twin. That's right. So it's the one who would usurps. It's, it's, it's much less dead <laughs> <laughs> uh, But Israel is the yeah. covenant in union with God. Jacob was just the name we settled on because I didn't want his name to be Eloy or. The choices were Eloy or um, some incredibly dramatic thing. So, um, <laughs> I kept doing yeah. so it was like negotiated to Jake. <laughs> we're going to find the really strange names in the Bible. Oh my gosh. Gunter. Um, just, I'm a wanderer in a strange land. It's like, oh my gosh. Sorrows. <laughs> Let's close the prayer. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for reminding us and guiding us about our life your Son Jesus. Help us to see the miracles that we for us every day. And the closest you have to us, especially the Holy Spirit. Holy you know all we say and we be your glory. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning. Is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.